first time I encountered the process mining camp. I think it was four years ago. I was uh, still a student here in TUE and managed to sneak in uh, during the coffee break for uh, some free snacks <laughs> and listen to the last couple of talks. Four years uh, later, I'm uh, back here presenting. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, today, I'll talk about process mining in uh, logistics. Uh, logistics might be, for van der Landes, something a bit different from what you understand. But uh, let me start with a question. How many of you flew over to the Netherlands to be here today with us? Okay, quite some people. And uh, how many of you have recently received a parcel from a courier company? Okay, quite some people. That's good to hear. Well, it's very likely that at some point, if you had a checked-in luggage uh, with your <coughs> while traveling, or uh, the parcel that you received eventually passed uh, by a system uh, made by Vanderlande. So what Vanderlande does is uh, logistic process automation, material handling, and we focus on three main segments: airports, warehousing, and uh, parcel. Uh, we have a lot of big customers like uh, Istanbul Airport, Amsterdam Schiphol, Hong Kong, Changi, uh, for warehouse, uh, Amazon, uh, Lido, Albert Heijn here in the Netherlands, and for parcel, DPD, UPS, FedEx, all the big uh, customers. So we focus on those three segments, and uh, today uh, we decided uh, that I will show you two case studies. One of them is uh, from a parcel customer, and the second one will be from uh, the airport business. So let's have a look at the standard uh, parcel process. Looks quite uh, simple, three things, three steps. You receive a parcel at the depot, you sort it, and you ship it to its right destination. If we have a look a bit more in details, uh, we see that the steps are a bit more. So we have uh, the arrival, uh, the unloading, so parcels come in various different ways, loose load on, in some special containers. Uh, then they're being put in the system. Uh, they're merged together at some point, and uh, they often go on a sorter where they're being sorted based on the scanning result uh, from the barcode read uh, to a specific destination. Destination, you can imagine that it's something like an output, varies per customer how the system is designed. And then the parcel is picked up, put in a bus, minivan, whatever, and being delivered to you at your door. Now, the customer that I will talk about today had a bit more specific process, and they had six different business rules to identify the destination for a particular parcel. So every night, our system was receiving the so-called master sort plan uh, via data acquisition, and that was the first level. Then we had... Uh, <coughs> Another level, uh, which was optical character recognition uh, of the barcode, uh, video coding, operator decision, uh, and even uh, postcode uh, sortation. So that's important to remember for the next slides. On the next slide, we'll see the, uh, the system of the customer. In a nutshell, the red things are uh, the sorters. So we have four different loop sorters, and they're interconnected between each other. And uh, basically, you can enter a parcel from any input, and the parcel can travel all around the system and be sorted in the other, uh, the other side of it. The green uh, part is uh, direct sortation to containers. That's typically done for small parcels like documents, envelopes. Uh, then we have the loose load uh, unloading. We have an area for manual sortation, but that's a bit too many details, so I'm not going to focus on that. Just to remember, it, uh, it's important that we have four different loop sorters. Now, the customer contacted us, uh, and that was, I think, maybe a couple of years ago. It was one of the first uh, test, uh, case studies that we did with process mining, and they told us, Wanderlande, come fix your system because uh, you delivered it and now it's not delivering uh, what, uh, what we expect. So we had a look at the data. Of course, we are very customer-oriented and we trust our customers, but it's always better to check facts yourself. And uh, I had a look at it and uh, for one day, uh, they had, for a normal day from the week, they had almost 180,000 parcels uh, for that day. 
and almost 28% of those parcels recirculated at least once in at least one of those loops. So that, you can imagine, is a pretty high number. And uh, what's the consequence of it is that once a parcel recirculates on the sorter, it basically blocks the input of other parcels. So at some point, the system becomes very clocked, and you cannot induct any more parcels, and they were even forced to uh, forward some of the parcels that they had for this facility to other facilities because they couldn't cope with, um, uh, <coughs> with the amount. Now, it was very powerful also to visualize this, so that's a very quick disco uh, <coughs> video of what was happening. And you can see that in the sorter 30, it's not very readable, and 40, you have a lot of recirculation. So all those parcels, they end up on the sorter, they recirculate, and eventually they are dumped when the maximum recirculation count uh, has been reached. So let's have a look uh, in the sorting in a bit more details. What happens is uh, you have main infeeds, and those are the, the infeeds when the, the trucks or the vans, whatever, arrive. The parcels are being uh, put there. Then they enter the sorter. They're being scanned in a tunnel. And uh, the, the tunnel is really a black box when continuously uh, an automatic tag reader uh, makes images and tries to scan the barcode. And then uh, our sorter sends a request for a destination, either to our controller or to the external interface, depending on which of those six business processes uh, is followed. We receive a destination and we sort it. Looks quite easy. Then uh, we have the crossover outfits and the crossover infeeds. So those are the positions in the sorter when we receive a parcel from other sorters or we send the parcel to other sorters. We have another scanner, and it's important to mention that every time when a parcel passes a scanner, there is a new request and a new reply for the destination, regardless if one already exists. Afterwards, uh, just before the main infeeds, we have a recirculation point. So once, that, uh, once the parcel passes through that point, we uh, raise the counter of recirculations, we provide a reason for recirculation, and uh, once that's, uh, that counter is uh, reached, we just dump the parcel, and that would be either manually handled afterwards, or um, we'll be relabeled, and there are many various uh, cases which can occur. Now, for this particular uh, customer, uh, the only recirculation reason that we received was destination not reached, which for us didn't really mean a lot because it's a loop sorter. And OK, it, me it means that the destination is uh, somewhere down, uh, downstream, but you don't know where exactly. So we started looking into uh, different uh, various sets of data I requested from the customer, their SAP data, uh, but we couldn't find anything until the last resort when I thought, okay, let's uh, do my favorite activity, enable debug mode, and uh, start looking at the application log data. I couldn't really understand anything from it, I'm not a developer, but uh, what I noticed is that uh, we had timestamps, we had some kind of identifiers that I couldn't really recognize what they mean, and we had uh, some message. The message could be anything from uh, storage performance uh, issues to a uh, turn off of a cluster to Java exception, basically anything. Nevertheless, I decided, okay, let's dump the data to, in Disco and see what happens. So. All the events that uh, were in this uh, application log uh, with uh, <clears throat> all the, let me rephrase, all the case IDs with more than one event in the application log had the below, uh, had the uh, above uh, process, and it was waiting for online ORS reply and then reply received. So this, those were cases when we were sending a request to the external interface for a destination because we didn't have the destination in our own data. Our own data. And on average, it was taking 6.8 seconds to receive uh, one, which you would say quite an OK uh, timing, especially if an operator decision is involved. So if the operator manually has to type the barcode, that's even quite good. But then we went back to the system design just, just to see that 
after the scanner to the crossover outfits and after the crossover infits to the first shoots, on three of the four sorters, the travel time was actually four seconds. So often what was happening was that the destination, uh, we were receiving the destination only after the physical location when we had to sort the parcel <laughs> has already passed. Then we were getting a recirculation uh, point, a uh, recirculation reason that the destination is not reached, which is actually valid. Uh, then again, the parcel was scanned, and this thing kept happening over and over again. So we showed this to the customer, and they couldn't believe that it could be that slow. But after some investigation, they figured out that they have uh, a lot of problems with the uh, storage, where we were sending the images, uh, and they were picking, it up, uh, picking them up with their external interface. So it was uh, yeah, a good uh, learning experience, especially for me to, to not be biased and try different types of data in this call, because I think probably applies for some of you as well. All the time I'm thinking, but do I have the right data? Do I have unique identifier? Do I have this? But sometimes just drop the data in the tool and see what it comes up with, uh, and uh, maybe you solve a problem. So that was the, the first uh, case uh, that I wanted to show. And that was yeah, really, I think, one of the first uh, process mining uh, projects uh, within Vanderlande. And uh, yeah, in this slide, uh, I explained that uh, the time is very short. And now about airports. Maybe that's a bit more interesting topic for uh, some of you, because I don't think that it's, or maybe I'm wrong, that it's uh, so popular what the process is. So what we do as Vanderlande is uh, the whole baggage handling system. So basically when you go to the airport and you place your uh, suitcase on that conveyor and it goes somewhere uh, in the basement, we do everything, construction, installation, project management, low level control software, hard level control, uh, high level controls, everything. So let's have a look at the standard uh, baggage handling process. You go to the airport, you check in your bag, and then the first step that happens, the bag starts traveling, and there is the whole baggage screening process. So that's, uh, that's the part together with identification. So during identification, uh, we try to read the, the barcode on, your tag, uh, on, on the tag of your bag. And during the whole baggage screening process, uh, the bag is analyzed with radiation for explosives. Now, when that's clear, that uh, there is nothing suspicious in your bag, and we have identified it either automatically or manually. The bag goes to the sorter, and uh, from there the destination is determined and it's sorted to the right location. Sometimes, if uh, you arrive at the airport too early, uh, and the output, the destination where your bag has to be sorted, has not been open yet, the bag goes temporarily to a buffer, where it's stored for a uh, until uh, the location has opened and is being retrieved automatically once the time comes. Then uh, the bags are loaded to the plane and the plane takes off. Now the process backwards, if you come and land to the airport, the bags are unloaded and then usually there is a classification, sometimes manual, some sometimes automatic, for arrival bags, they're put on the conveyor and you pick it up at the exit. And if it's a transfer bag, you're changing your flight to somewhere else, your bag uh, goes through the same process that uh, a normal check-in bag goes through. <laughs> Having in mind this one, uh, just very quickly about uh, how we do project management in Vanderlande. Maybe some of you are familiar with the V model. So once we try to sell a project, uh, <clears throat> we execute a case study uh, with a simulation study, and in, during the simulation study we have to prove that the system that we are uh, designing is going to meet the, the user requirements of the customer. Then they say yes or no, and then we start, if it's a yes, we, uh, we start working on it, and there is the system design, subsystem design, component design, and so on. Now on the right side are the testing levels, and the last level is the customer acceptance testing and the operational trials. I joined last year the Istanbul uh, airport project to be responsible for this last part of uh, 
excuse me, of, uh, of the testing. Uh, and uh, this last part of the testing could be different types of functional and non-functional tests. And the most important of them is the last one, the performance test. During this performance test, you have to show to the customer that the system is capable of uh, meeting all the high-level requirements. And those requirements in this case was that for one hour, the system should be able to sort 20,000 bags uh, with availability of 99.99. .99. The read rate of uh, the scanners has to be uh, around 99 as well, I think. Then uh, you have uh, the most important for the customer KPI, that from any point in the system, input point in the system to any point, to any output point in the system, the travel time for the back should be not more than 24 minutes. Now, just a brief, a brief look about uh, uh, how the system looks like. The system was uh, designed as two hemispheres, west and east one, and each hemisphere was divided into uh, two subsystems, middle east and uh, east and middle west and west. Now, within the hemisphere, this, uh, all four were identical uh, systems. The only thing that they were sharing is here in the middle where it says MES, and that's the manual encoding station, when if we cannot read the tag of, uh, on your back automatically, the back goes and there is an operator which tries to read it uh, with a handheld device. And the area where uh, uh, the manual inspection of bags is performed in case the bags are being suspicious uh, for explosives. So we have the two, um, the, the two hemispheres and uh, the subsystems in between. It's important to mention that the, between the, within the hemisphere, you could go easily from one subsystem to another via the final sort uh, step, which is the small uh, rectangle. But between the two hemispheres, you always had to go via the loop where the buffer with the, uh, for, backs, for early backstore was. And that usually increases dramatically the travel time because the, the loop goes only in one direction. So if I check in something in the, uh, what is it, in the west side, it means that it has to go via the full loop because it goes out and goes to the east side. So we really had to think about a scenario that we would be able to meet all the KPIs but uh, also we didn't have that much time. So before actually executing th those trials, we did multiple tests with about 5,000 bags, and we figured out that that requires usually a day and a half of preparation. You have to uh, take those bags from the warehouse, print the labels, put the labels, put the bags on the right destination, instruct the people at what, what time and how they have to put them in the system. You have to organize all the logistics around it, all the, <clears throat> all the people in the different positions, plan the flights. So in such an environment, when it's the end of the project and uh, time is very scarce and a lot of different subcontractors are working uh, in the same area with different work permits, it's very hard to organize a test, which is 20,000 bags. We didn't even have 20,000 because during the, the multiple tests, some of them got broken, some got stolen, so we even had to, talk about that, uh, to think about that. <laughs> And what we decided to do instead is first take the scenario that we had from the simulation study, but because of all the constraints, we didn't really classify this one as, uh, in the assumptions as very feasible. So we just took it as an input, we improved it a bit, and we put it in our emulation environment. So for every big project that Wanderlande does, we make an emulation environment which is an exact replica, at least for the high-level controls of the production system that we have on site. And we use that for in-house testing uh, to fix big part of the issues before we actually go on site and deploy the software. So that saves us a lot, a lot of time here in the Netherlands, but it was also a good opportunity to use this as a test and training to, uh, <clears throat> to infeed our scenarios and fine-tune uh, the results and fine-tune the scenario based on the results that we see. And that's when we used process mining as well. So what we did basically is a big scenario with 20,000 bags, with all the flights, what's the input rate, 
uh, how often, from where uh, the bags go, what kind of attributes they have, like weight, length, and everything. So we could really be very, very close to the real life situation uh, uh, for the particular test. And we could also decide afterwards when we analyze the data, what portion of it we want to include. So if I was to be interested only in the time between the checking of the bag and the screening, I could include more events from the different data, uh, data that we have. Important to mention here is that uh, it's mandatory to do full tracing of the bags. So whenever a baggage item enters our system, we do full end-to-end -end tracking. So at any point in time, we know where your bag is unless it gets lost uh, somehow, but that's, uh, that's an exception I'm not going to talk about now. Mm. So we have a lot of data, and uh, most of this data uh, could be combined in various ways because we have different unique identifiers. Uh, <clears throat> so we use the data first to get a general view on, uh, on how, how good uh, our scenario is, and then it was really easy for us to use the duration filter and filter everything that is above tw uh, below 20 mi uh, 24 minutes out and really see which are the bags with the longer in-system time. So we could really pinpoint immediately and say, OK, that's because this route is being blocked. That's because of this flight. We didn't plan that flight correct, and, uh, and so on. So for us, it was, yeah, the benefits were less resources, less logistics, a lot, uh, a lot less time for site testing. Of course, happier customer because we could go with a proper verify scenario and we could even demonstrate the scenario to them up front. <clears throat> so we knew that uh, from the first try, it will be at least, if not successful, very close to successful. So in the first run that we executed, we had 98.5% of the bags with less than 24 minutes uh, in system time, and the last one was 99.99. .99. That, of course, doesn't guarantee exactly that you will be successful in the real life because things happen, there are failures and so on. But it was good enough for us to be confident and go to the customer and present this. And then, in addition to this, what we also did Afterwards, for the operation and maintenance team, we executed different uh, failure scenarios. So in our emulation environment, we could also say, OK, at that point in time, fail this equipment for five minutes. And then you can really observe the dynamics of the system, first in the emulation environment itself, but then also by using the animation in uh, Disco. Because when you look at the emulation, you see so many bags and you don't know which ones are the good ones and which ones are the bad ones. But with the filtering and the variants, it's very easy to really pinpoint, OK, that's the, uh, that's the part of the system that we have to focus in case we have um, certain failures. So that also helped for improving the standard operating procedures for the maintenance team, especially they knew if that piece of equipment fails during peak hour, we have not more than 10 minutes to fix it. Otherwise, we have to take uh, other contingency measures. I think um, that, that's about it. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Okay, so you can already think about your, your questions. I have a first question. Yep. Uh, and now this morning we talked about that sometimes for some processes, like especially ERP processes, like what's the, the ID or the, the, the case ID object changes over the time of the process, right? Now, in the physical world, like if we're talking about parcels or yes. bags, that's usually not the case. You have like, for example, like this one parcel that's moving around. So I'm just curious whether in all the different types of process mining analysis that you have done in this space, have you come across different case ID perspectives? Have you played with different, are there even options for, for what you see as the case, or did you come yeah, across? Well, uh, yeah, we have different uh, unique identifiers, so for example, uh, we could use the, the bag tag, which is on your bag, as a unique identifier, but what about the trace before the bag was identified? Then you need a different unique identifier okay. to be able to trace this object and to connect the, that's your, really your bag, 
to what happened before. Or maybe the bag gets lost in tracking, then it's re-identified. Yeah. Then we have to use another new identifier, which was generated by the system, to be able to couple this. But uh, to answer the question, I've tried, for example, the, the flight number as a unique identifier. Okay. And that's also interesting in case uh, you're, you have a bit of a bird view, high level view. Um, of course, it depends how many of those bags in this case were actually identified that they're for this flight because some of them might be flight coded uh, with a different flight and there are a lot of exceptions that have to be taken into account. But I think it really depends on what kind of uh, uh, question you want to answer. If you really want a high level overview, yes, you can use uh, the flight number or you can use even things like the input location as a unique identifier. For now, the, the identifier that the system generates turns out to be the best in case you're interested in travel times. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, who has a question for Boris? Okay, we start here. I will be loud thinking a little bit. Do you have... Um, time pressure that you need to deliver this package. So that your system need to, for example, when the airplane comes, mm -hmm. so this is usually ground handling to the whole process of bring these luggages from the airport, uh, from the airplane to the sorting. Do you have the time pressure for the airport that you have to manage within a particular time? Yeah, well, when we deliver the system, yeah. we have a contract that it's measured as a KPI on a monthly yeah. basis if we have bags which take travel time more than 24 minutes, and we have to usually pay penalties if that's do, not the case. Do you mean 24 minutes f from the April comes? I no. Mean, I am looking for the turnaround yeah. process. Yeah, Plus so uh, if you look at the end-to-end -end process from uh -huh. the touchdown of the plane uh -huh. uh, to the takeoff of the plane, that's depending on the airport, of course. Uh, in Istanbul, it was one hour. So for one hour, and those were classified as the best connection times of Turkish Airlines at that time, even though they have uh, some less connection, uh, some shorter ones as well. You have normally up to 20 minutes or 15, 20 minutes from the plane to unload, bring it to our system, load it into it, maximum 24 minutes in it, take it out and bring it to the, pla to the next plane. Okay, so 24 minutes are from landing to the customer. Yeah, well, actually what I explained now is a transfer flight. So if you come from somewhere, you have in total one hour before the next connection uh, usually takes off. But for, uh, for what you mean, it uh, depends on, uh, on the airport. Now, for example, for Schiphol, we have uh, requirements from when the bag enters, the, syst uh, enters uh, the arrival system until it's with the customer. But then we don't have uh, influence on the KPI of the ground handler so sometimes they took some time. More questions? <clears throat> Over there, yes, please. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I wonder if you used um, the, the tag number as a recognition uh, for the bag. And I wonder, uh, and you said in one, at one, uh, in your in your speech, you said there are different attributes uh, recorded in the system, like length, size, etc. Uh, I'm just thinking from a practical point of view. I lost a bag a few times on, uh, on my travels, and uh, it took me quite a while to uh, to get it back. And I wonder if you are using or planning to use any uh, visual recognition of the bag to to make it quicker to find the bag, actually, not the tag, except. Thank yeah, you. So uh, for visual recognition, a lot of our customers nowadays have uh, OCR systems, but that's to identify the bag. If the, bar, if the tag reader doesn't work, then we have optical character recognition first of the tag number, then of the flight coupled with the date, then you have video coding, and then you also have the operator uh, decision. But that's if the bag is within our system. 
We also have a lot of cameras all over in the basement, and we can spot bags. But sometimes your bag just don't enter the system at all. Some airports still have the so-called tail-to-tail sortation. So if it's within the country and the regulations allow it, they just bring the containers directly from one plane to another. And sometimes in those containers, there are bags for, the, uh, for other flights, and that's how your bag gets lost. <laughs> Hi, here. Yeah. Hey. Oh, okay, uh, I have a question uh, related to, uh, so it's very interesting what you are doing, the way you are using process mining, and I'm wondering if you are planning to use basically this methodology also for uh, other projects. So is this something that was a one time, or you think this is something that maybe Wanderlande should do for all its projects? Yeah, uh, well, good question. If you ask me, uh, we should be doing this with uh, all our customers. Uh, but in fact, it really depends on, uh, on the customer. So we have customers that we are more like a partner in assets. So we maybe help them only with the maintenance. They do operations and everything themselves. We have customers that you have actually hours allocated for process analysis. And you can really have nice discussions about those kind of things. Uh, so it really depends on the customer, also sometimes on the account manager. If the account manager is willing to invest some money of the process improvement engineer to have a look at the data and do like a teaser analysis study to the customer, that also works. But in addition to this, we have a cooperation already with uh, Eindhoven University of Technology and we have a couple of uh, PhD students with Vanderlande and uh, we, are also work we also have some interns now on site and we are um, in the office, which are working on different graduation projects, and uh, we are developing our own process mining uh, software. And a second question, if possible. Uh, because when I look to, uh, I'm linking to a totally different topic now. Okay. Um, when I look to the simulation environment, it yeah. immediately uh, brought me to the digital twin storylines that basically now it's again also a hot topic. And I was wondering if you are using uh, the emulation environment also afterwards as a digital twin. As a digital? Sorry. Twin. Twin. Uh, well, for most of the project, we try to update the environment every time when certain changes occur. But that also depends on what's our relationship with the customer. Now, for some customers, we have a service contract that we do maintenance and operations for them. Uh, but for other customers, they want to do everything themselves. And if we execute certain changes, sometimes there is just no budget for updating the model. It's, um, the same applies for the simulation uh, uh, models as well. We try to do it as much as possible, but if it's too much work and there is no budget, you just don't do it. More questions for Boris? Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I wonder, how did you get so knowledgeable about this process? Because before we were talking about black boxes and uh, not talking to people and so on. And is it well, it's from the data or with talking or else? Well, it's uh, the, the standard, you mean the baggage or the parcel process or overall? Both, warehouse, Both. airport. Well, it, uh, a lot of it comes uh, with experience, I would say. Uh, you visit customers. What we try to do as process improvement engineers is to match the facts from the data, often with visual observations. So often when I go and visit customer, I try to stay there a couple of days, talk with certain people, look how they run operations, and then try to map it with what I see in the data. Okay, so not completely out of the data? No, no. There are humans, well, in the beginning, humans involved. In the beginning, you start only with the data. Uh, maybe you have some training on uh, what's the standard process, but then most of it is on the job, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. Uh, I'll think of you next time uh, my bag's missing. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking, 
Um, when you did the airport simulation and the figures improved from 98 to 99.9%, .9%, what did you change to make that improvement? Because I, I would imagine that you're constrained by the design of the um, emulator. Um, yeah. So, so what, what changes did you make to, to get well, that improved? We tend to follow the idea that if you put wa if you input waste, you get uh, waste at the output as well. So we really had to look at the input profile of our bags and how our flights are planned because that really has a big impact. In the system that you saw, we had restrictions that certain part of it is only for domestic flights, other part of it is for transfer and international for different airlines. So you can really play with the planning of the flights through different outputs, and the, dis and the different outputs, of course, mean different travel time. And, and do you have control over that in real life? Can you? change the plan at Istanbul no, Airport? Okay. No, you create a scenario, you put the flights up front, you plan them in the software, and then you press the play button and all the bags go in. Okay. That's why we had to refine the scenario many times, because we had to see what works best for this input profile.